Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. What I'm going to do with this video is take a look at Anthony Morris, who is currently a member of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, and sort of take a look at what I've been able to find out on how his life has gone and where he came from, who he was before becoming one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And so hopefully you'll find this information kind of interesting. I don't know every detail of his life, but these are things I've been able to find out just by Googling around and various public records that are available. So I'll kind of be using the public records and then also you may want to have Tony's a life story, his autobiographical article that he wrote that was in the 2015 Watchtower. I'll probably reference that a little bit too because that has some corroborating details. Yeah, so to begin with, Anthony Morris, he was born in 1950. He was born in the state of Michigan in the United States. It appears that he spent his whole time in Michigan from what I can tell. The website classmates.com has a great collection of high school yearbooks from all over the country and going way back in the past. By going through, I would say approximately one million yearbooks, <laughs> I was able to find the photo that Tony published in his life story. He did show his senior high school photo in the article there. Eventually I ran across it flipping through yearbooks and so you can go on classmates.com Dot com and it, if you zero in to the state of Michigan, the city of Saginaw, the high school was Douglas MacArthur High School, and Tony graduated in 1968. So if you go to the, this is the 1967 yearbook for Douglas MacArthur High School, and uh, what you'll find in the juniors section is under the camera shy list of students who missed getting their picture taken, you'll see a T. Morris. So that's Tony there as a junior. And then we can go one year ahead to the 68 uh, high school yearbook. And that's where we'll start to find his, um, his photograph. So I'll just flip down through the pages here. So these are all the seniors, and uh, yeah, and so there, there's our friend Tony. I thought maybe he might have had a different last name because he talks about having a stepfather in his story, but uh, nope, still Tony Morris in 1968, and you'll recognize the photo there from the same one that's in the Watchtower magazine. Now there is one other interesting photo in the yearbook here. Uh, it turns out that Tony played some basketball when he was in high school. And so we have a picture of that. So that's right here. So he played for the team, the Generals, or I guess they were called the Cagers. And uh, yeah, if you look at this team photo, you'll notice Number 20 in the front row there is indeed our uh, Tony Morris. So it's kind of a cool picture of him there. Now it might just be me, but maybe I was kind of thinking, are those shorts a little tight? I don't know. So that's where Tony graduated from, 1968, Douglas MacArthur High School in Saginaw, Michigan. And actually the school still had his address on file from that time period. And it was this address here, 665 Bel Air Drive in Saginaw, Michigan. So you can kind of see this is the house that Tony was living in, at least part of the time when he was in high school there. So it was just kind of interesting to, uh, to see that. Okay, so that brings us up to 1968, graduated from high school. In July of 1968, Tony Morris joined the United States Army. I'm not sure if he enlisted or if he was drafted after finishing high school. At either rate, 
he joined the uh, army at that time. Now, the National Archives in the U.S. is where all military records are stored, and they can be requested by any member of the public under the Freedom of Information Act. It's a pretty easy process, as long as you have enough identifying information for them to definitively pick out the right veteran to pull their records on. So I was eventually uh, able to provide them enough information to where we were able to get a hold of Tony's military records. Not everything, but a decent amount of information is provided by the National Archives. So I'll just kind of start here. You'll have to bear with me because there's a lot of different sources here I'm juggling. So yeah, as we just start at the top here, Anthony Morris. You notice uh, Anthony Morris Jr. is how he's listed here. So presumably his father was named Anthony Morris uh, Sr. And one thing that I've noticed is, well, he refers to himself as Anthony Morris III in various spots, for example, in his uh, life story. I haven't really noticed that anywhere else except things that he himself refers to. Generally, he seems to pop up as Anthony Morris Jr. on the various records. But yeah, he joined the United States Army. You see his service number there. He served from July 17th of 68 through June 25th, 1970. So he did his two years. He was discharged in 1970 at the rank of a Specialist 5, uh, which, as I understand, is not a rank that uh, exists anymore after it was discontinued after sometime after Vietnam. Uh, so we'll look at some of the other papers here. You notice it says transcript of court-martial trial is not in the file. I wasn't sure what that meant if he had been court-martialed, but that is not the case. <laughs> he No court-martials for Tony. It simply means they're there never was a court martial, so that's good. Place of entry was Detroit, Michigan, which makes sense considering he was living in Saginaw, Michigan. And the last place he was in the Army was at Valley Forge General Hospital, as he relates in the beginning of his life story. So that is everything on that paper. And we'll go to the next one that the archives provided. Now this paper is listing all the decorations, awards that Tony received during his time in the military. They include the National Defense Service Medal, one overseas bar, the Vietnam Service Medal, the Vietnam Campaign Medal with 60 device, and a Marksman's Badge M14 with rifle bar. So Nothing super extraordinary here, no Purple Hearts or things like that, but that makes sense considering he was assigned to work in an operating room. It's kind of a thankless task many times, working in the medical environment, and no outstanding moments of valor typically. So those were his awards. What we see here is his military education. So two things, two sections that he was in initially. He was a medical corpsman was his education. The MOS code or military occupational specialty was 91A, medical corpsman, and that was at Fort Sam Houston in Texas, the 10-week course in 1968. We'll see more on that. And then after that, he specialized more to become a 91D uh, operating room specialist, also at San Antonio, Texas, a four-week course there. So we'll look a little more at his all the stations he was at during the military with this paper here. So as we mentioned, he uh, enlisted July 17th of 68, Fort Knox, Kentucky. After that, he on July 29th, he was sent to begin basic training, and he did that at Fort Knox, Kentucky. That was his basic combat training. As you can see, his conduct was rated excellent, efficiency excellent, and the last column reason is PCS, which is permanent 
change of station. So he was then assigned to another location. So after basic training, we can see that on October 14th, he was sent to his advanced individual training. So that is where he would now learn his MOS, his military occupational specialty, which as we saw was 91A, that uh, is a medical corpsman. From what I've been reading, that is basically similar to EMT basic on the civilian side, so uh, the first level of EMT, and so learning a lot of medical basics, taking blood pressures, assessment. It's a pretty, I've taken the EMTB course in the past, and it's a, you really learn a, a lot of information about caring for injured humans. Now, he was learning that at, uh, as you can see, Fort Sam Houston, Texas, in uh, San Antonio. That's a large center for training the medical personnel in the U.S. Army. I'm going to refer a little bit also to my Reddit posts on his Vietnam service. Fort Sam Houston is known as the home of Army Medicine, and it's a very large training campus, and they train all sorts of medical specialties there in San Antonio. And Tony is actually mentioned in one of his talks being stationed in San Antonio and noticing the Catholic Church there. They live in shameless luxury, and even in Texas, in San Antonio, I'll never forget, but in the military there, and on their knees, these people went by two blocks away, crawling on their knees to go up the steps of the church. And there he is sitting there, rain all the way up. Sincere people now, we're not picking on them. And he's all glorious, and these are such poor people. They didn't have a thing. But what they did have, they were given to them. And they're living in their shameless luxury. So yeah, so I uh, stationed in San Antonio initially does the basic medical corpsman training there and starting January 5th of 69 he transitions over to the MOS 91D operating room specialist also still at San, in San Antonio there. He begins his training there and I did find a uh, little description of uh, what that would typically involve and so you can see that there basically now he's going to be building on his basic medical training to work in and around an operating room. So you can see prepping sterile supplies, getting the operating rooms ready for surgery, providing assistance during surgery as needed, doing the pre-op, post-op procedures, receiving patients, assessing their vital signs, recording their medical histories. So no doubt a busy busy job in in Vietnam. So that was his training there. Started that in January. We can see in February of 69 he went over to Fort Sill, Oklahoma to continue his medical training there. And then in May, May 14th, he transfers to Fort Benning, Georgia. The uh, paper here says basic ABN, which I I'm assuming means airborne. There's an airborne school at Fort Benning where paratroopers do their jump training. So perhaps he got a little taste of that. And then we can see there June 2nd en route to U.S. Army Pacific, PAC Pacific region. So he's on his way to Vietnam. So he's done about a year stateside. Now on his way finally to the Vietnam War. And so we can see the next date there, July 6th. Third Surgical Hospital in Vietnam. And he's now working in his specialty there, operating room specialist. So I'll refer back to my Reddit notes here. And you can see in his life story, Tony talks about arriving in Vietnam in July. He says, like all new arrivals, I was allowed one week of orientation so that I could adapt to the different time zone and the intense heat. Soon after, I reported for duty at a surgical hospital in the Mekong Delta in Dong Tam. Initially, he arrives at the largest U.S. Army base in South Vietnam there, which was called Long Bin Post. Just a massive Army base there, the largest by far. I spent about a week of orientation there, and then he transfers south into the Mekong Delta to the Army base at Dong Tam. 
Dong Tam was the base for the Army 9th Infantry Division, a good sized base there. And Tony was working as a member of the 3rd Surgical Hospital in the 68th Medical Group, and they provided the medical care for the 9th Infantry on that base. So he spent about seven weeks there, and he has talked about the bombing or shelling, the mortars that would come down on that base there. I had been in bomb shelters when I was in Vietnam, uh, new, you know, young soldier. I did uh, operating room work there, but when I first got there, they were bombing, you know, after you got my orientation up around Long Bend, I went down in the Delta, was down there for some months, and they were bombing all the time. It was like the 4th of July, but it was real. Not a pleasant thing, you know, these wars. Well, anyway, uh, I was working 12-hour shifts, 7 at night to 7 in, uh, excuse me, 7 in the morning till 7 at night. And later, I'd switch and went to night one. So I got tired. Even though I was young and I loved working, I loved medicine. Uh, and so when I go to bed, I remember when I was first there, just my first few days there, they start bombing us, sending in these mortars. Mortars, get up, you know, because I mean, what do you mean get up? I heard the bombs too, dummy, you know. So get your helmet, so I had to get a helmet and a flak jacket and all this stuff to go down in the bunker, which was right there by where our barrack was there. I get in there, and it held about 20, as I recall. I would not It's not an exact science in the memory of that. But I'm looking around at all and wearing their helmets and the flak jackets. And of course, mine was brand new fatigues. Everybody knew I was brand new. And I'm looking at all of them. I said, hey, let me ask you a question. What? Because they're all nervous. I can tell they're nervous. And let me learn something here. I said, what happens if one of those mortars hits us directly? They said, I said, so this is a coffin. <laughs> so... And I don't recommend this, and I was young, I'm, sir, I'm just telling you the experience. So from henceforth, I didn't get out of bed. <laughs> and they'd say, you're nuts. I said, forget it, and I'm not going out in the coffin. I said, I hope it doesn't hit you. And one night, a big chunk of shrapnel tore my locker up, by the way. I was so glad that hit the locker instead of me. So it, they could say it was foolish. I got used to it. I said, I got to get some sleep sometime. So, yeah, so that's what Tony has to say about serving at the base in Dong Tam there. Now, what was happening was that right as Tony was assigned to work at Dong Tam, the whole 9th Infantry was rotating back to the United States, and the whole Army base was actually transitioning over to the South Vietnamese forces, the ARVN. And so as we look at his record here, we see that September 1, he is reassigned to the 93rd Evacuation Hospital, which was uh, actually back at the Long Bin Post, the base that he first arrived at. So he was down in Dong Tam on the Mekong Delta about seven weeks, and we can assume that's where he was talking about being shelled, because at Long Bin, that was an extremely well-protected base there. It was kind of the main base for the whole Vietnam War. And the last attack of any size that was launched against Long Bin was in February of 69. So that was about seven months before Tony was stationed there. So for the period that Tony was there, 69 to 70, really, a, I mean, for being in the Vietnam War, Long Bin was the place to be if you had to be over there. An enormous army base, they say it approximately covered an area the size of the city of Cleveland, Ohio. So just a massive base. There was a great article on HistoryNet.com called Easy Living in a Hard War Behind the Lines in Vietnam. And it really did a great job describing what life on the base was like. So I'll just read a little bit of it here, a couple excerpts. Home to the Army's Vietnam headquarters, Long Bin was, in the words of one resident soldier, quote, a virtual REMF citadel, unquote. REMF meaning rear echelon mother effer. So not the greatest of uh, opinions by the guys on the front lines for the REMFs. 
But anyways, the article continues. The shooting war was far away, and soldiers stationed at the post had plenty of time on their hands. To keep them busy, military authorities provided a full slate of recreational opportunities. As of July 1971, the post boasted 81 basketball courts, 64 volleyball courts, 12 swimming pools, 8 multi-purpose courts, 8 softball fields, 6 tennis courts, 5 craft shops, 3 football fields, 3 weight rooms, 3 libraries, 3 service clubs, 2 miniature golf courses, 2 handball court complexes, a running track, an archery range, a golf driving range, a skeet range, a party area, and an amphitheater for movies and live shows. Open mess clubs, which served food and alcohol and often featured live entertainment, abounded throughout South Vietnam. At its peak in 1969, Long Bin's club system had 40 bars with a net worth of $1.2 million, including $270,000 in cash on hand. If soldiers didn't like club life, Long Bin's retail stores stocked food and alcohol to host private parties at the pools, barracks, or barbecue pits. An unofficial brothel, a male beauty bar with salon services, and outdoor movies rounded out Long Bin's offerings. So quite a, uh, quite a location to be at, uh, like I say, if you had to be a soldier in the Vietnam War. And this is where Tony remained for his final eight months in Vietnam. And there was a sprawling hospital complexes there. So he was with the uh, 93rd EVAC hospital. There was also the 24th and the 21st EVAC hospitals there. And so staff definitely did treat combat casualties on the base there. But this is also kind of the base that soldiers would go to for things like dentistry, OBGYN, and really just a wide variety of routine care as well. They would treat mainly soldiers, but also some civilians at Long Bin. Okay, so Tony was there, as we say, until into uh, April of 1970. We can see there April 18th, 1970, he is transferred to the back to the U.S. stateside, and he ends up at Valley Forge General Hospital, which was an army hospital in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania at that time. And Tony, in his life story, is not super specific about this. He says simply, I was a 20-year-old soldier suffering from a serious infectious illness. So it's a little vague exactly what kind of infection he had. I imagine there was a few things it could be. It could be something, an infection related to living in the tropical area like that. It could be, I suppose, a sexually transmitted disease he had picked up along the way. It could be perhaps he had some kind of open wound that had gotten infected from his work in the operating room. Whatever it was, they ended up transferring him back to the States, which was a little surprising because Long Bin kind of was, they had all the facilities there to treat soldiers. But there was a point, you know, eventually along the way that Long Bin did start shutting down slowly but surely, and patients were transferred back to the United States. And so I'm not sure if that's what contributed to this transfer back or, or not. It's not clear. But regardless, he was uh, transferred back to the hospital in Pennsylvania. And you can see there, actually, he remained at the hospital until his discharge in June. So he was there at the hospital a good two months, really, from what it seems like here. So I'm not sure if that entire time he was a patient or if he began uh, working in his uh, as a corpsman again there. But... Regardless, we can see June 25th, transfer to USAR, the Army Reserves, released from active duty, REF, RAD. So that was the end of Tony's military service. Spent about 10 months overseas in Vietnam and two years total in the military. So definitely did serve in Vietnam. Now we can say that, well, the seven weeks he spent at Dong Tam were probably very challenging. The remainder of his time, the other eight months in Vietnam, were at a good base to be at that 
was not where you weren't in in fear of losing your life every day, I guess we could say. So that's good. But obviously, as with probably almost every Vietnam veteran, serving in Vietnam had just a tremendous impact on Tony in many ways, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. He was definitely impacted by the casualties that he saw come in from combat. Really, I think we could say took a little bit of a toll on on him emotionally. In his life story, what Tony says is, after returning from Vietnam, I felt a need for God in my life. Painful memories had numbed me emotionally. And he also talks about that in one of his talks, the idea of being emotionally numb. And now, it's just very, very concerning for me you see, I was uh, in Vietnam, a medic in that war. Uh, I've seen what happens to humans when they're mangled. You see it on TV and some of that. Well, until you smell human flesh burning from a helicopter crash, people that look like uh, humans, like a hot dog on a grill, blackened and splitting open. Uh, I know what's coming in Armageddon. A lot of dead people. A lot of dead people. So it's absolutely urgent for us to get our minds off ourselves. And let's get out there and help as many as we can. Because when it comes, it's going to be numbing for you. You think seeing a deer mangled on the side of the road from a truck that hit it is upsetting? You see humans like that. So it's going to be numbing. So yeah, obviously his work even though he wasn't a combat soldier, definitely took a toll on his psyche. Certainly those in the medical field develop a real black sense of humor, kind of that macabre humor as a coping mechanism, because otherwise you will go nuts (laughs) dealing with injuries and things of that nature. But we can see also that what Tony saw happen to soldiers in Vietnam as they would come in back from fighting and they would come in for surgery he has used those experiences to kind of inform his concept of what Armageddon will be like when kind of the Vietnam War will be expanded on an exponential basis affecting the entire world based on Jehovah's Witness theology of of Armageddon. But yeah, certainly when Tony returned from Vietnam, he sought some solace in religion. And, uh, oh, I just want to mention one other clip that he has talked about how it is difficult for soldiers to return to civilian life. And if you've ever been in the military, and I know some of you here personally that were, uh, I, I was in the war in Vietnam before I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. When Jehovah calls him a wild beast, because the enforcer for the governments is the military. Let me tell you, Jehovah describes them just like they are. Like animals. The way they can kill. And then they expect them to come back to this country and act normal. Can't act normal after you've seen all of that. After you behave like a beast. So in this clip he's talking about, seems to be talking more about combat soldiers who are trained to kill. But he does seem to be a, a little bit of personal insight there when he says you can't act normal once you return home after seeing what you've seen in war times. Is it possible that Tony is suffering from PTSD from his service in Vietnam? I I don't think anybody would be surprised that a Vietnam vet has PTSD. In his life story, Tony has mentioned some things that might reflect on that. For example, he writes, In war, people do terrible things. I was no exception. So, taken at face value, it's kind of an odd phrase that he writes here, that he did terrible things in war, considering what we know of his job, which was not in a combat position, but it was working in an operating room. So it's a little hard to tell if it's just perhaps exaggerated a little bit, or did he do terrible things? I guess certainly things do happen with occupying forces in in countries where assault or rape of civilians 
uh, happens while soldiers are there. Did he do something terrible in the operating room? He didn't set up an OR quickly enough and a soldier died? Uh, It's hard to say based on the information there. He does describe pretty clearly a flashback. Once he returned to uh, and was living in Florida, he talks about he was working in the emergency department of a hospital down there doing night shifts. And so he had just finished working all night in the hospital. His parents had kicked him out of the house. He was living in his car. And he talks about having a flashback sitting behind the Kingdom Hall down there. So certainly, yeah, flashbacks could definitely be a sign of PTSD. If there is some PTSD there, it is pretty challenging for Jehovah's Witnesses because going to a therapist or a psychologist is definitely, I would say, frowned on by Jehovah's Witnesses as an organization. It's definitely not encouraged. And as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, Tony isn't taking advantage of any groups that the VA hospital might offer where vets can meet together and debrief on their shared experiences in Vietnam and other wars. Hard to say in that regard. Step away for a moment from the uh, life of Tony and look a little bit at who his family is, where he came from. He doesn't mention a whole lot of information in his life story, simply that he has a mother and a beloved stepfather, and that's about it. But in one of his talks, he did mention a little bit more about his parents. So we'll hear that. It's amazing what's going on because of the generosity of Jehovah's people. Giving to the worldwide work, and then the governing body sees that it goes into places that uh, it'll do the most good. And uh, I have to tell you this here because we know so many of you. Uh, you know my dad's a, a well, a wealthy man, and my mother. And they're not Jehovah's Witnesses. He's ninety-two, and uh, she's uh, high seventies. And he's always wondering, well, is that where's all that money going? You know, and uh, that somebody's stealing, and you're 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 just stupid, Tony. You know, and uh, they're taking advantage of you. So that long ago. He says to me, you know, what are they doing with the money, the they, the they? And I told him, I said, look, I'm part of the they. (laughs) It's not happening. (laughs) And he went, oh. (laughs) I said, part of the they. (laughs) So... So he mentions a few things. He says that his dad is 92 and his mom is high 70s. Using the school records, we were able to find out his home address in Michigan when he graduated. So using the address, you can go into the county records, land records, and whatnot. What we can find is who was living in the house at that time. And so here's a document that I ran across And so these are uh, Tony's parents that he was talking about. So you can see here Victor H. Grasmick and Shirley M. Grasmick, his wife, 665 Ballard Drive in Saginaw. And I believe, if I remember right, this is the deed to do with their their property there on Bel Air Drive. So yeah, so these are his parents. And so there's Shirley is his mom. So once I ran across this paper, you can find out a little more about his parents. And so um, we'll look at that here. And so this is his mom's obituary from 2013. And you can kind of see the family resemblance there. So Shirley May and her maiden name was Day, later became Grasmick. She was 85 when she passed away, was living in Florida. And you can see some things that Tony mentions in his life story. He has two brothers, John A. Morris and Ronald M. Morris. He also has a half-sister, Victoria, from his stepdad's first marriage. Yeah, so that is Tony's mom. And uh, being that she died in Florida, Florida has actually a really good public record system 
So there's many, many documents that the public can kind of peruse down there. So one of the things was Shirley's uh, death certificate here. And so just a little bit more information there. You can see she, she was born in Saginaw, Michigan. So uh, presumably that's where Tony spent much of his childhood as well. Uh, she was widowed when she died. Victor had, had died first. You'll notice there her occupation is listed as a restaurant owner. And we'll see that for Victor as well. And just a little information about her parents there. So that was in 2013 that Shirley passed away there. So we can conclude a few things about Shirley's life. She was, as we say, born in 1927 uh, in Saginaw, Michigan there. So being that her three boys had the last name Morris, and in particular Anthony is Anthony Morris Jr., we can pretty safely assume, I think, that she got married to an Anthony Morris at some point. Just guesswork, but I assume maybe after World War II ended, so you know, that 1945-46 era, possibly when she got married. Definitely married by 1950 when Tony was born, and uh, she had the three boys. And we can assume that she got divorced at some point between when Tony was born in 1950 and the mid-60s. And that's because she got married to Victor Grasmick, as we saw there. So on that house lease or deed, they're listed there as husband and wife. And so who was Victor Grasmick? Well, surprisingly, I wasn't able to find an obituary anywhere for Victor, but was able to find a little bit of information on his grave here. And you can see that, as Tony mentioned in that talk, which based on the age of his dad that he mentions there, was around 2005 when he joined the governing body. So, but yeah, Victor was born in 1913. He lived until 2010, also died in Florida. And a little bit of information here about his family. There's his parents and his siblings. Now, you might be wondering, what about Tony's birth father, Anthony Morris, presumably? Well, I didn't really run across any information on him. And to be honest, I didn't dig super deeply into it. It doesn't seem like he plays a large role in Tony's life down through the years. So by 1965, when Tony would have been 15, his mom remarries. And so when he talks about his mom and dad, he typically... It appears he's talking about his, his stepdad, technically. So here is Victor's death certificate. As we mentioned, he died in 2010. You notice he also here, as part of his occupation in his life, is listed as a restaurant owner-operator. It says he served in the armed forces, presumably during World War II. And uh, it mentions that he was actually born in Germany, and came over, presumably pretty young, to the United States. You know, eventually served in the U.S. military here. So we see this thread of owning a restaurant. And actually, if we look at Victor's brother, John, that's also mentioned. So this is Victor's brother, John, his younger brother. Died in 1976, but you notice he also is listed as a bar owner and operator. So I'm not sure if it was a family business that they several of the Grasmicks owned together, but uh, we can see some more evidence of that in Victor's divorce proceedings. So we can see that Victor was initially married to a Marion E. Grasmick. And this is their divorce paperwork. So this is from February 23rd, 1965. And the deed to the Bel Air house of Victor and Shirley was from the summer of 1965. So presumably somewhere in there is when they got married. But you'll notice in particular in this divorce document that Marion and Victor owned a, a piece of property. And you notice the description there that there is a home situated on the real estate and in addition a building comprising a bar for the sale of alcoholic beverages and food which is known as Meadow Gardens. And there was a liquor license shared between Marion and Victor. So evidently this Meadow Gardens 
bar, restaurant, tavern in Saginaw is the restaurant that Victor owned. Maybe his brother John was a co-owner and Shirley also joined the business after her marriage. And I didn't really find where there was a um, a sale of the Meadow Gardens establishment. So I'm not sure if Victor sold his share of this restaurant bar because he eventually Shirley and Victor moved to Florida. So I'm not sure if he kept that the Meadow Gardens or if he sold it when he moved permanently down to Florida. And as we saw in the obituary, Victor had one child, Victoria. It's funny how everybody in this era you know, Anthony was Anthony Jr. Victor named his daughter Victoria. But anyways, so Victoria was his daughter from his first marriage with Marion. So it would have been Tony's half-sister. I'm not sure, but the impression I get is that she may have been a little older than Tony. And so wasn't really around when Tony was was there. And as we mentioned, eventually Shirley and Victor migrated and moved to Florida. It seems like initially they owned a condo down there and eventually moved down there permanently at some point in the kind of in that 1970-ish time frame. And Tony actually mentions the condo in his life story. So Tony turned to God, and certainly this is something that many Americans in that era were doing the same way, looking for answers from some kind of higher authority. In an interview that XJW Fifth, who has a great YouTube channel with many good interviews, uh, a little while back he interviewed a psychotherapist, Dr. Fusco, and she actually mentioned how that time period was one when many people were turning to religious groups for help. Smart people dream all the time. I think uh, the older you get, the less likely you are because you've just seen more life. And especially my generation, because we saw this flurry of cults after Vietnam, after Watergate, after our, our turmoil in the 60s and 70s. The civil rights movement was huge. And there were cults that flourished after that because we're trying to redefine ourselves as a nation. Um, and God forbid I should have to spend years figuring out whom I am. Much easier to have someone tell me for me. Yeah, smart yeah. people should help. Yeah. Broken up there, but Dr. Fusco says a couple of times, smart people join cults. Cults are very persuasive, and a person's intelligence doesn't correlate with whether they will join up or not. And so Tony was one of those, after returning from Vietnam, that was really seeking answers. And he mentions in his article that he visited many churches in the Florida area where he was staying. And nothing really caught his interest until he visited a Kingdom Hall meeting. He mentions that watching the little kids there looking up scriptures in their Bibles impressed him. And he began studying the Bible with Jim Gardner. One of the brothers there, an anointed brother, evidently. He was studying the truth book at that time. So this is in 1971. And certainly those years up until 1975 were a big buildup, not just in terms of people seeking answers from religions and cults, as Dr. Fusco said, but for Jehovah's Witnesses in particular, that time period was very exciting. There were statements and publications that had focused on the year 1975 as a year that something very exciting could happen. Not quite sure what, but it seemed possible that paradise could come in 1975, that that's when Armageddon would occur, maybe. And so there was a lot of intense interest in that year, and as a result, a lot of uh, excitement and really helped create this zeal among Jehovah's Witnesses. And the truth book was one that talked about 1975. They called it the Blue Bomb because it was a, had a blue cover and uh, was one publication that helped many folks become Jehovah's Witnesses. I remember hearing stories growing up that the song Crystal Blue Persuasion was written about the truth book. 
And that's how much esteem witnesses held that book. So Tony relates that in just a few weeks, he qualified and became an unbaptized publisher there in Florida. And uh, he talks about his attempts to witness to his family. He writes, I boldly but bluntly preached to them. He says, I forcefully shared the truth with them. I later had to apologize for my insensitive manner. And here he's writing about talking to his two brothers, John and Ron. We can imagine that Tony was also witnessing to his parents. And he relates that, from his perspective, a result of his becoming associated with Jehovah's Witnesses was the reason that his parents evicted him from their condo down there. So here we have a document of the Shirley and Victor Grasmick, and this is actually talking about them joining a condo association down there. And this was the Boca Tica condominiums. So this is from July 1969 when they picked up this condo. And you notice they also became members of the Boca Tica Country Club in West Palm Beach there. And so very likely this is the actual condo that Tony mentions in his article where he was later asked to leave by his parents. And what's interesting is it actually looks like Victor's brother, John, who you might recall maybe owned the bar with him, uh, also owned a condo in the Boca Tica condos down there. And this is a deed from 1979 where John's widow, Laura Grasmick, is selling her condo but you'll notice it's the same condo unit. John died in 1976, and so she sold the condo a few years later. Tony goes on to relate that he had some money in a savings account back in Michigan, and so in May, he leaves Florida, drives back to Michigan. He mentions in his story witnessing along Interstate 75 on the drive back. If you look at a map, I-75 actually runs from Florida all the way straight into Saginaw. So it's understandable that I-75 would really stick in his memory. We find him next in July of 71. He is at the Divine Name District Assembly in New York City at Yankee Stadium. And that's where Tony gets baptized about four months after starting to study. Now it's possible Sometime in this period, he becomes acquainted with Susan Kettle, and Susan would become the future Mrs. Morris. So maybe they met at the assembly? I'm not exactly sure. Find him dating Susan in Cranston, Rhode Island. So we'll turn our attention just for a minute to Susan's family. Susan was born in 1948 and graduated in 1966, and so this is her high school year, uh, senior photo. She attended Cranston East High School in Cranston, Rhode Island. And so we can see it actually gives her address at the time there, 14 Grove Avenue. She was in a couple groups, office practice, class. She was a corridor marshal. So this is the office practice group. You can see Susan right there in the second row. Here we see the group of corridor marshals, and we see Susan here on the left side. And so you recall that the high school yearbook had her address at the time of her graduation, 14 Grove Avenue, and looking at the Cranston land records, we can, this is actually the list of homeowners from that time period for that address. And so we can see her parents here, uh, Forrest S. Kettle and Florence M. was his wife. You can see that they lived in that house until 1968. So when Tony talks about see, watching uh, Susan studying on the porch while they were dating, it wasn't in that Grove Avenue house. But here, this is the actual house. 
So this is the house that Susan lived in while she was attending high school, Grove Avenue in Cranston, Rhode Island. Tony writes that by December of 71, he and Susan got married, and both are regular pioneering at that time. So it's interesting to reflect that Tony was only baptized in July, and so in that six-month time period, he dated and marries Susan as a brother baptized about six months at that time. It's interesting because in talks, Tony has talked about advising sisters to be selective in who they choose as a marriage mate, advising that at the very least they should be marrying a ministerial servant. I guess the question is, could Tony have been a ministerial servant in six months? It seems pretty quick, but on the other hand, things were moving pretty fast in that pre-1975 era. So, who knows, I guess. Tony and Susan spend their time pioneering in Rhode Island, and we find them next in 1975. As we know, nothing extraordinary happened in that year. The world did not end, and Armageddon and the Paradise did not come. And so the Morrises decide to kind of take a breather and step back off the, off the treadmill of pioneering and going 110% for the organization. So they both stop pioneering in 75, and they start a family. That's the year that their first son is born. And that's really reflective of what many Jehovah's Witnesses did in that post-1975 time frame. There was a general slowdown among witnesses. If you look at the figures, there was a net decrease in the number of pioneers of about 15,000 that stopped in and after 1975. And so Tony and Susan were just uh, reflective of that general trend among witnesses. So their first son, Jesse, is born. We can see that they picked a, a good Bible name for their first son. And in 1977, their second son, Paul A. Morris, is born. Again, they choose a Bible name, Paul, as good witnesses tend to do. But we see his middle initial is A, so I'm curious if they named him Anthony for his middle name to try and keep, obviously Anthony is not a Bible name, but put it as his middle name to try and keep that chain of Anthony's going, perhaps. In 1979, Tony resumes pioneering again, and this again reflects a general trend among Jehovah's Witnesses that by that 1980-ish time, the zeal among Jehovah's Witnesses started to bounce back, and the disappointment over unfulfilled expectations around the year 1975 had kind of worn off by that time period. So Tony joins the pioneer list again. Interestingly, Susan doesn't until both the boys are in school. So presumably around perhaps 1983, she starts pioneering again. That's kind of unusual among Jehovah's Witnesses that you would see the husband pioneering, whereas the wife doesn't. It's usually the other way around. It would be interesting to know what Tony was doing for work during this time period because he must have had a pretty flexible schedule to pioneer at that time. I'm not sure if he stuck with the medical field to support himself or if he was doing something else. In 1980, Susan's father, Forrest Kettle, passes away. And then in 1986, Susan's mother, Florence, dies. We have Florence's obituary here. You notice it says she died at the home of her daughter, Susan Morris, of Narragansett. So the Morrises lived this entire time in Rhode Island. We see here in 1986 they were in Narragansett and were evidently taking care of Susan's mom until she passed away at that time. And we can see it mentions Susan's siblings as well, one sister, Janice, and two brothers, Bruce and Wayne. After both of Susan's parents had passed away, the Morrises were more free to pursue greater activity. And so it was that the following year, 1987, they moved to North Carolina to serve where the need was greater. And it was during this time period of living in down south North Carolina that Tony began serving as a substitute circuit overseer at some point, and both his sons begin pioneering also at some period down there. 
We find them pop up next in 1990 when Tony and Susan buy a house in Lumberton, North Carolina. This is one of the documents about them buying this house. And you can see the address there, 1418 East 7th Street in Lumberton. And again, these are public documents from North Carolina's public records. Anybody can view them if they wish. Here we have the mortgage paperwork for the house that Tony and Susan buy in Lumberton. You notice here we kind of see the first reference where Anthony refers to himself as Anthony Morris III. It would be interesting to see how he did it on the marriage license, but those records aren't public record just yet. So you see they take out a mortgage for $44,000, a 30-year mortgage. What's interesting is Based on this here, it looks like they were using a VA loan, a Veterans Administration. So they were okay with using some of the benefits of uh, having served in the military, which again, I would say is fairly common viewpoint among Jehovah's Witnesses. And we can see their signatures here. Anthony signing as Anthony Morris III. Susan, looks like Susan might be a lefty, judging for, from her signature, so that's interesting. Well, just going by their birth dates is probably around 1991-ish that Jesse, the Morris's older son, graduates from high school. In 1992, we see Tony pop up as one of the trustees for the congregation in Lumberton. We see him here, a trustee for the East Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. Looks like they're buying some property there for the congregation. Around 1993 was probably when Paul graduated high school, Tony and Susan's younger son. Again, both the boys are regular pioneering at this point. And we find that in 1993, about three years after they purchased the house, they end up selling the house in Lumberton. So this is the document about selling the house. You can see that Denise Britt and Stanley Jackson bought the property. See here, Tony is referred to as the third again, and he signs that way. And so sometime in this time period, I assume after they sold their house, Tony has been serving as a substitute circuit overseer, and at some point in this 93-95 range, presumably is when Tony and Susan start working full-time as circuit overseers. Not sure exactly what year but safe to say that it's probably been a good 25 years anyway that Tony has not worked secularly, and that entire time he and Susan have been supported completely by the Watchtower organization. Tony writes that both his boys went to Bethel at the age of 19, the minimum age, and so in 1994 would be when Jesse goes to Bethel, Jesse would later marry his wife, Stephanie, is what Tony tells us. And I'm not sure if Jesse is, is still serving at Bethel or not. We find Tony popping up again as a, as a congregation trustee in a 1995 document here. And here we see that the West congregation in Lumberton is evidently selling its kingdom hall to the Happy Hill Word of Deliverance Fellowship. And uh, again, Anthony is one of the congregation trustees on the paperwork here. And we see that Tony has dropped the third after his name here. In 
In 1996, their younger son, Paul, is also accepted to Bethel at the age of 19. Paul would later marry Raquel. Paul served at Bethel for a number of years before leaving, and now he lives in Illinois. Here we see the house that Tony and Susan bought in 1990, lived in for about three years, and this is in uh, Lumberton, North Carolina. So at this time, Tony and Susan are serving full-time as circuit overseers, and in 1998, they receive a new circuit assignment. It would be in Suffolk County, New York, and their address at that time is the address of a kingdom hall, as seen here, and so evidently their home base was a circuit overseer's apartment there, and it looks like we can see in the bottom left corner there the CO's lodgings at the kingdom hall there. Circuit overseers rotate assignments about every three years. And so in 2000, the Morrises got their new circuit assignment, and this would be in Hampton County, Massachusetts. And again, their address at that time was another circuit overseer's apartment, and we can see that here in Massachusetts. In 2002, the Morrises receive a new assignment after their three years, except this time they're pulled off the road, and Tony is assigned to the service department at Patterson Bethel. And so they begin living at Bethel. Tony initially works in the service department and is afterwards assigned to be a helper to the service committee of the governing body. So for Tony, certainly this would be a, a nice promotion. Unfortunately for Susan, there is no leadership roles for women among Jehovah's Witnesses, and so her reward for Tony's promotion was that she started working in the laundry department at Bethel. I'd be curious to know what she thought about that change, because certainly working in the circuit work is pretty challenging assignment, being on the road so much. But I'm not sure if it would have been an improvement. Here, Susan, over the age of 50 years old, has to start working full-time in a laundry. Tony writes that she absolutely loved it, but it would be interesting to get her thoughts on that. Now, Tony, along the way, somewhere in this time period since becoming one of Jehovah's Witnesses, had determined that he was anointed. That is, that he was one of the 144,000 people that would be going to heaven when they died to serve as kings and priests. You might recall that Tony's initial Bible teacher, Jim Gardner, was also anointed. And so being that he was anointed, he was eligible to join the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, and that is indeed what he did. After three years, he was called to be a governing body member. And so in 2005, Tony and Susan moved to Brooklyn Bethel. In 2010, you recall, was the year that Tony's stepfather, Victor Grasmick, passed away. And in 2013, Tony's mother, Shirley Grasmick, passes away. What's really interesting is there were some documents, a number of documents, to help take care of Shirley's property and, and whatnot after her death that the boys had to work through. And we have in particular here a document that initially went to Tony and then was sent down to his brothers for them to sign. And you'll notice, so here's the page that Tony signed up in New York State, that he's reverted back to being Anthony Morris Jr. here in this paperwork that his brothers were going to see. You can see there's his brother's signatures uh, later on after the paperwork was sent down to Florida. So you can kind of see a trend that Tony has referred to himself as Anthony Morris III in things that his wife and other Jehovah's Witnesses would see. But both before he was a witness in his military paperwork and in this paperwork that his brothers would see, he refers to himself as Anthony Morris Jr. In 2016, the Morrises moved to Warwick Bethel once that was completed. And so if you Google them now, you'll find that their current address is 40 Kings Drive in Tuxedo Park, New York. And that is simply the 
street address of Bethel there in Warwick. What's interesting is I ran across in my research this establishment in uh, Warwick there called the Savvy Chic Boutique. It's a consignment shop there. But what's interesting is looking at the reviews from customers, notice the second review there. It's from Susan Morris of Tuxedo Park, New York. So I'm going to assume there's not an overabundance of Susan Morrises that live in Tuxedo Park. And most likely this is our Susan Morris, Tony's wife. And you notice what she has to say about the Sabi Chic Boutique. She says it is clean, professional, great selections, friendly, welcoming, great prices. There is so much to see and take in. This is a shop that is well worth the trip to see. I cannot walk out empty-handed. So certainly a glowing recommendation from Susan Morris there. So next time you're up visiting Warwick Bethel, you may want to take a side trip and pop into the Savvy Chic Consignment Boutique, recommended by the family of governing body members. And that brings us up to the present day for Tony and Susan Morris. One thing I was still curious about was you recall that in one quote from a talk, Tony says that his dad is a wealthy man. And I was curious if that, if there was any information on that. So I'll show you what I learned. I'm no expert on reading legal documents or things of that sort, but I'll lay it out for you and you can go from there. So to begin with, we know that Victor owned the Meadow Gardens bar restaurant up in Michigan and I'm not really sure what happened with that if he owned it for a long time or if he sold it when he shifted down to Florida but once he was in Florida there are a lot of real estate documents referring to houses and uh, various properties that the grass mix bought and sold and they bounced around in florida they lived in four different counties as a couple they tended to buy condos near country clubs by 1980 we find that victor was actually a director in a finance corporation down there and so that's what we see here it was called the dolphin finance corporation And you can see here, Victor is listed as a director of this corporation. And they were kind of a mortgage corporation, from what I understand. So this is around 1980. Here's some documentation from later in the 80s. We find now that Victor has resigned as a director of this corporation in 1988. The reason for that is the man below him, James Mims. It turned out that James Mims, who owned the Dolphin Finance Corporation and a number of other mortgage companies, was running a Ponzi scheme in Florida. So here's an article from 1985 when Mims was charged with running his Ponzi scheme and, as it says, defra defrauded more than 500 people of $14 million dollars And so many Florida residents ended up losing money in his Ponzi scheme. And finally, here's another article, a whole three years later before he was finally convicted. But he was convicted of fraud, received three years in prison, 38 years probation in order to repay his investors. And so as you look through the legal records that are available, again, very openly available records in the state of Florida. And you'll see Victor's name crop up a number of times in these mortgage lawsuits as a director of the, the Dolphin Finance Corporation. So here's an example of one here from 1991-1992. And it seems to have been mostly lawsuits against uh, you know, mortgage companies trying to recover their money from the Ponzi scheme. Now I want to point out that 
I didn't see anything to where Victor was implicated in the Ponzi scheme. Mims was the only man that was convicted of this whole thing. In fact, this is a document from 1991. This is a lawsuit against the insurance company that insured MIMS to try and recover some of the money that was lost. They were able to recover $800,000 from the insurance company. However, you can see how many people there were that would be receiving money from that settlement. And you can see they're listed several grass mix, including Shirley and Victor, as victims in the Ponzi scheme. In 1990, we find the grass mix buying a house in Brooksville, Florida, and there's the address there. You recall in 2010, Victor died, and so this is Victor's will at that time. And so you'll notice here that the things in his house he bequeaths to his wife. And the remainder went into a trust that he had set up. A re re the Victor H. Grasmick Restated Revocable Trust Agreement. And here we have a document explaining a little bit more about the trust that Victor had set up in a document that I didn't print it out, unfortunately, but uh, the trust that he established divided his belongings between his wife, Shirley, and his daughter, Victoria. I believe, if I remember correctly, it was a 60-40 split, 60% 60 going to Shirley. So after Victor died in 2010, Shirley decided to sell the Brooksville house that she had been living in, and she moved, she bought a house closer to her son's. And so this is talking about the house being sold here for $160,000. And this is that house that she sold in 2011. So there's a photo of it. And here's the same house on Zillow. Just a little more information about it there. And so, yeah, you can see how Shirley did indeed sell it in 2011 for the 160 grand. And so we can see here Shirley buys a new house in the Villages, Florida. We'll see later she pays just about exactly 160000 for this house. So that works out well. And there's no mortgage paperwork, so she evidently pays cash for this house. In 2013, Shirley herself dies. And so we see here her will. Her will is actually very similar to Victor's will. So the things in the house, in her car, she leaves to her children. And the rest, her money and whatnot, is left in a trust. And so here's Shirley's trust paperwork. And the part that's maybe of most interest to us, after her death, her estate of the, the trust would be split into thirds and divided between her three sons. 
So we see here some of the trust paperwork as regards her house in particular. And the boy's preparing to sell her house. And so here we have a document that we looked at earlier because it was showing how Anthony signed his name as Anthony Morris Jr. when his brothers would see the paperwork. But now looking at what the document actually is, and again I'm no expert, but if I'm understanding it correctly, the three brothers as a unit and as inheriting the trust of their mom, Shirley, which owned the house, the three brothers sell the house to Ronald as an individual, and he buys it as a personal individual. And so here we see Shirley's house that she lived in until her death in the villages, Florida. And here's just a little more information about the house. So you'll notice that Shirley bought it in 2011 for basically $160,000, which is what she sold her old house for. The three brothers, as a unit, sell the house to Ron for $106,000 in 2014 after Shirley's death. Ron kept the house for a few years and then sold it himself in 2017 for $225,000. So that worked out pretty well for Ron. So what can we say? Well, at the very least, in 2014, there was the price of the house sold, $100,000, and that money was divided between the three brothers, John, Ron, and Tony, in equal parts. So at the very least, we can say that in 2014, Tony inherited about $33,000 from his mom's estate. Now, Florida has no estate taxes, and they have no inheritance tax. New York has no inheritance tax. So Tony wouldn't have paid any taxes on this money that he received. Certainly, I think the question is, exists of uh, how much money was actually in the trusts that both Victor and Shirley had set up beforehand, and we just don't have that information available. But if there was additional money on top of the price of the house, Tony would have also inherited a third of that. Looking at Victor and Shirley's last house together, I don't think I would call it an extravagant mansion at all. On the other hand, both of them grew up through the Great Depression, and so the type of house they lived in might not be reflective of the kind of savings they had saved up over the years. When we look at Tony's brothers, John and Ron, after Victor and Shirley had both passed away, neither of them moved to expensive beachfront properties. In fact, both of them live in houses very similar to Shirley's final house. In March of 2019, Tony was recorded buying over $800 of liquor at a liquor store, and there was a lot of concern from folks that he was spending money donated by Jehovah's Witnesses to the Watchtower organization, spending it on this expensive liquor. But I think it's clear that Tony has his own savings that he can use to buy liquor or whatever else he would like to do with it. Bethelites are under a vow of poverty at Bethel, but that vow refers more to earning money on the side while serving at Bethel. And Bethelites are allowed to maintain their savings, and money they receive. They're not obligated to turn in that money, as it were, to Bethel. And so I think that wraps up our look into the life of Anthony Morris Jr., Hopefully you found it interesting, maybe shed a little more light on his life and experiences, and thanks for watching. Take care.